Hey guys, it's Greg from BitGoblin again, and today I want to show you all how to set up a local caching server to speed up your game downloads using LandCache. It's actually not a single piece of software, but a collection of a few pieces of open source software that's all bundled up in a nice tidy little package that's easy to install using Docker and just a little bit of elbow grease. So let's get started. You smell that? It smells like a BitGoblin. I guess the first question we should answer today is, what is LandCache? Originally known as SteamCache, it is a self-hostable service that allows you to locally cache game downloads and other files from th services like Steam, Epic Games, and Windows Update. Basically, the idea is to use an HTTP content caching server like Nginx to, well, cache HTTP payloads that get passed through it. And it uses DNS to redirect game launchers and other software to run through this caching server. There's a bit more to it than that, and frankly, HTTP caching servers are nothing new. They're actually a pretty old technology. But what LandCache is, is a kind of pre-made solution to get all of this set up for you, all tidily in a nice little Docker image, without too much effort, and easily enough that you don't need to be some Linux and networking power wizard to get up and running. Awesome. And the best part is, is that since this is open source software using common tools bolted together, you can easily extend the DNS configuration to cache other services that aren't already configured by the LandCache team, provided those services don't only serve content over HTTPS, but we'll talk more about that later. Now it's time to get to the good stuff, and let's get this bad boy installed. There are two main requirements for running LandCache. One, an OS that can run Docker, which typically I would spring for Linux, but you could run it on Windows since that's also a supported platform for Docker. And two, you need a system that has a good amount of available storage to actually cache your games with. Regarding the first point, the official way to use LandCache is through Docker, which in case you don't know what that is, essentially it's a tool that makes it really easy to set up applications using what are called containers, which are a lighter weight form of virtualization and app isolation compared to full-fledged virtual machines. I know that's a really bad and really quick explanation, but th the specifics don't really matter for this demonstration. I will also note that on my demo system here today, I'm using the official Docker packages from the Docker Community Edition repository. Though the versions of Docker or other container runtimes provided from your distribution should work just fine. They may just have some small quirks that you may need to work around. Now, as for the second point, while you technically could get away with like 30 gigabytes of storage, at that point, you'd only be able to cache like a fraction of a modern AAA game or only some older, smaller games, and you really wouldn't be getting much of a benefit from a tool like this. So you really should be running this on a system that has like 500 gigabytes or more of storage. To be clear, the system I'll be demoing on today has a small hard drive. It only has 100 gigabytes. But again, I'd recommend at least like 500 gigabyte drive, if not more, since like a terabyte drive can be had for pretty cheap these days. On Nube, you can find them for as little as like 40 bucks. All right, so the system I'll be using for the demo today is a Debian virtual machine with just a couple gigs of RAM, two CPU cores, and a 100 gigabyte disk. Again, to actually take advantage of LandCache, you really should have a larger disk, and I wouldn't actually deploy the system as is. But anyways, in a browser, what you need to do is go to landcache.net, as we'll do here. And thankfully they've got the instructions for getting started right on the home page nice and easy. And as you can see, it's only four commands. What we need to do actually before running these commands is install git because we need git to clone the uh, repository for the Docker stuff. So hop over in our terminal. Let's just run a sudo apt install git, nice and easy. Already installed on my system, but in case it isn't, you'll just need to install it. So now we can run this git clone command. So let's just copy that, paste it over here. Boom, the repository is cloned. Now we just need to cd into that LandCache directory, if you type it correctly. And then we need to open up that .env file. What this is, is it has some parameters that a LandCache needs to get started. For most use cases, you can probably leave this use generic cache setting to true, unless you want to have these uh, services split up across separate hosts. But some settings that you will need to change are this LandCache IP and DNS bind IP. They're going to be the same address on this host because we're running both the DNS and the caching service on the same host. So let's just change this to the IP address of this host that we're running on, which for me is 10.7.10.115. I had to think for a second. And then DNS bind IP, same address. The next thing you might want to change is upstream DNS. By default, it points to the uh, Google's public DNS servers. You can leave this as is if you don't have anything special running internally. But if you do, like myself, I have a DNS set up for local name, name resolving. 
Um, or if you're running something like PyHole, you will want to put the IP address or IP addresses in this variable right here, just like so. I use 10, 7, 10, 14, and then 10, 7, uh, 10, 7, 10, uh, 13 for my DNS IP addresses. This is Creature Greg coming in with one small correction. Uh, so for this upstream DNS line, what you need to do is not just put a space in between your IP addresses, but put a semicolon after each address. Before I had this, where it's just the one IP address space the other, but instead I should have put a semicolon after the 14 in, in the first IP address. It's an easy little change. Uh, unfortunately, I forgot it, but let's get back to the video. We can leave the cache root alone. And then the last thing we really want to look at is this cache disk size. The main reason for this is actually this last bullet right here, right above the variable, saying set this to a little bit less than your actual available space. Give yourself like an extra like 15, 20 gigabytes of space so that, you know, your system can, you know, start up, start services, write logs, and whatever else it needs to do so it doesn't crash. And so at this point, we can leave everything else alone. One thing you might also want to change is the time zone. It's really only important for, as it says right here, for the um, logs in the container. I'm just going to set it to my local time zone, which is the Eastern time zone. Once you're done with that, you can save and quit. And then all we got to do is run this last uh, sudo docker compose up command. Just going to copy and paste it because I'm lazy. Ah, that's right. I forgot that um, since I'm, I'm using the generic docker install from the, the docker official repo, whatever it is, the docker compose is actually not a ooh. It's actually not its own command. Um, it is actually like a sub command of Docker. So this should work. There we go. Now it's starting to pull the uh, required images from Docker Hub. And we'll check back in a little bit once the images are done downloading and the container starts. <laughs> and as I say that the container finishes. All right, so I did a little looking around and I kind of realized that I kind of had a typo when I was uh, writing that uh, .emv file. So let's open that back up, back up to the top. And what I needed to put in DNS bind IP was 10.7.10.115. Yeah, small, small little typo. Um, anyways, let's try that Docker compose command up again. And look at that, both containers have started. Of course, we need to test it to make sure it actually works. You know, any work on anything wouldn't be good if you didn't test it first. So to test it, what we first need to do is set up our client, which in this case is just my workstation, to use the LAN cache DNS server as the system's you know, DNS server. Now, what you really should do is change your router or whatever device handles your DHCP leases to hand out your server's IP for the DNS server setting. But for this demo, I'm just gonna change my local system since that'll be quicker. To do that, since I'm running a Linux system, I just need to edit the etsy slash resolve.conf file with admin privs, of course. You don't have to worry about most of this stuff in the file. You just have to worry about this name server line. We're going to change that IP address to the IP address of my LAN cache server. Save and quit. So what we need to do now is head on over to Steam and download a game. And for that, I'm going to use Borderlands 2 today, since it is a large enough game to take some time that I can show you what's going on on the server, but it's not too large that it will take a million years to finish. So let's go ahead and kick off the install for Borderlands 2. And so I can show you what's going on with the server. Let's head back to the terminal. On the server, let's run sudo iftop. If it's not installed, you can just do it in sudo apt install, nice and easy. And let's make this font size a little bit smaller so we can see what's happening. For every connection that, that goes onto your system, there's two lines. There's a sending line and a receiving line. We can see that to this 10.7.20 address, which is my local PC, we're sending about, it, it fluctuates a bit, but we're sending somewhere around 500 megabit per second. And then we see several of these like deployed static connections. Sometimes it'll be like a valve.net address. And under the pull line, we can see something like 100 to 200 megabit per second for each of these lines, which these should add up to somewhere around what's being sent to my PC. And if you want to see like a nice total bandwidth usage, you can see on these transfer and receiving lines at the bottom, the rates are 537 megabit and 541 megabit. Obviously, it's fluctuating, so it's going to be slightly different. But what this all means is that it's pulling data from Valve servers and then sending it to our local PC. All right, so Borderlands 2 has finished downloading, but of course this isn't quite useful yet with just the first download of a game. So let's go ahead and delete that game. Let's just uninstall it from our PC and let's just kick off a new install. This will just simulate installing it on a new PC. All right, and now with the download started, uh, we can see by going back to our terminal with the Lancast server on it, that we're actually sending a ton of data to our local PC again, as we expected. 
Actually, it's sending quite a bit more than before. It's sending well over 500 megabit, which is more than my milk adapters support. So I'll take it. That's cool stuff. But we're also not really pulling much data, if any, from Valve servers. And we can actually confirm that by looking at the transfer rates at the bottom again. We can see that we're sending just under 900 megabit to my PC and we are receiving under 10 megabit. So most importantly, this means that we're not pulling much data from Steam servers, which I would assume it's just pulling some checksums or something very small to check everything's all right. And that means our cache is working as intended. So this is cool and all, we got a LAN cache server working and it was rather easy, but you might now be thinking something along the lines of why is this important? And why would this be useful to home users? Well, the, the typical use case where you might see this hotness in action is at a LAN party, hence its name LAN cache, where you might have 10, 20, 50, hundreds, or even thousands of gamers at a single event that are there to do one thing, play games. And usually they're multiplayer games, so they're all playing the same games and need to download or update them all at the same time. Instead of downloading one game 50 plus times and just letting your WAN connection bottleneck the process or paying up for some ludicrously expensive pipe to the internet, using LANcache, you only have to worry about one initial download and then serve it to as many people as needed. And on a smaller scale, if you're not well endowed with a piping hot, fast external internet connection, then this can still be beneficial for a family if you have multiple gamers at home or even at a small office with several PCs that need to get Windows updates. Even if you have a gigabit or faster connection to your home, this can still be useful to alleviate some of the congestion caused by you and your kids downloading a couple large games simultaneously so as to not affect other devices using the internet, say you're streaming TV or something. Or in an altruistic sense, I guess you can also look at it as a way to lower the burden you place on the wider internet as a whole. There are plenty of circumstances where you may want this, most of them boiling down to trying to work around a slow internet connection or possibly just trying to ease your burden on other servers. But of course, no software is perfect. Every piece of software, large or small, has its limitations. And the first limitation that comes to mind for LAN cache is it's unable to cache HTTPS requests, which are HTTP requests that use SSL to encrypt the traffic. HTTPS was created to prevent man-in-the-middle attacks where a party intercepts your traffic and raids or modifies your request data. And if you were paying attention earlier, that is essentially what LAN cache is doing to cache the game content. It reads and stores the content while it is in transit. And if it sees you're requesting content that it's already got stored, then it will serve that content instead of pulling it from the remote servers. And if you're thinking, well, why not just cache encrypted packets? Well, that really wouldn't be useful since the encryption keys change between the client and server with every new request and two requests for the same file would appear different to the server. So it really wouldn't be caching anything. So unfortunately, when it comes to requests that occur over HTTPS, the best solution is just to use an SNI proxy to essentially just pass through the HTTPS traffic undisturbed and uncached. Thankfully, a lot of the services that serve games and other large content like Steam, Epic Games, and Windows Update use HTTP for their traffic so it can be cached, but some others do use HTTPS and thus cannot be cached. Also, I've mentioned this earlier, but I want to reiterate that it cannot speed up the first download of a game since LANcache needs to first download a game to store it before seeding it to your machines. Now, you could use one of the pre-seeding tools that LANcache.net provide to kind of get a head start on downloading games and updates to your cache, but you would still need to wait for games to download to your cache initially, and it doesn't really help with any future updates or games that you purchase without rerunning the pre-seed. And in my opinion, the main value to tools like this are that it's automatic and seamless to the end user. And if you've got to log into a server and run a script manually, then that kind of takes away the automatic and seamless nature. So this is what makes LANcache not really a useful solution if you've only got one computer, or at least just don't install the same games on multiple computers, like say you have your nice and sexy AAA games on your gaming tower and some retro and lighter weight games on a laptop. You'd really only be wasting storage space and power by running an instance for just one PC. So again, this is intended for a multi-system use case. But overall, even with those limitations, I think this is still a pretty cool tool to keep around. It may not be used all the time and in every situation, but I can definitely see me setting up a server on my home network to cache games for my PC, laptop, test bench, and my fiance's PC. I also think it's really cool when the open source community really comes together to put together gems just like this that can really improve the experience of a lot of home and even office users. You know, Windows Update is a thing.
And it's really not that hard to set up since once you've gotten past installing Docker, all you've really got to do is just edit one file and run like two commands to get it going. I love it. Big ol' heart. All right, that's all I have for this one. As always, I'm curious to know what your guys' thoughts are on this video, land cache, or other self-hosted software you might want me to take a look at. So be sure to sound off in the comments section below. If you dislike the video, then you know what to do. But if you did like it, then go hit that like button really hard and also consider getting subscribed and hitting the bell icon so you don't miss my future videos on self-hosted goodness. I've also got a Discord server if you'd like to join the community and just chat and hang out with us. Or if you need it, we can try to help you with your self-hosting problems. I hope you all have a great day and I will catch you in the next one.